All right, what's going on, everyone? So today we're going to talk about Russian nuclear threats, which is crazy, and I feel like we don't always appreciate just how out of control some of that language is. We're going to compare some map services looking at the battlefield in Ukraine, which might be feeding the trolls. I'm not sure, but I'm going to roll the dice anyways. And then we've got an American soldier that was arrested and is currently being held in Russia. Now, this video is going to have chapters because each one of those are loosely related to the war in Ukraine, but there's not a lot of flow between one and the next, so feel free to bounce around as interested. So starting with these Russian nuclear threats, which should not be a normal thing, are not a normal thing. They're becoming normal, but we should not normalize any country around the world threatening the use of nuclear weapons. We've got a couple articles and statements I'm going to run through here. A lot of this is tied to what Russia is tying this to is uh, French President Emmanuel Macron last week reiterating that he does not exclude sending French troops to Ukraine at some point in the future. And the UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron said that Ukraine will be able to use British long-range weapons to strike targets inside of Russia. And then, of course, the continuous conversation about F-16s arriving in Ukraine. So starting with a May 6th statement from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm going to read through this entire thing because it's important. And it's, it's their words exactly, right? This is not being taken out of context or misrepresented. This is the statement coming from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to give you an idea of the language they're using. They say, in the near future, multifunctional American-made F-16 aircraft are expected to appear on the Ukrainian theater of operations. As the Russian side has repeatedly pointed out, we cannot ignore the fact that these aircraft belong to dual-equipped platforms, non-nuclear and nuclear. Regardless of what specific modification these aircraft will be supplied in, we will perceive them as carriers of nuclear weapons and consider this step by the United States and NATO as a deliberate provocation. So they're viewing the F-16s, no matter how they're equipped, showing up in Ukraine as carrying nuclear weapons. So again, F-16s provided by the U.S. and other NATO countries to Ukraine, where Ukrainian pilots are being trained on those, and Ukraine is going to fly those aircraft, Russia is viewing that as NATO or the United States equipping those with our own nuclear weapons and flying those at Russian territory. There's some pretty big leaps that have to be made to come to that assessment, right? The idea that we would just hand off nuclear weapons to Ukraine in the first place, or that we would put, you know, I guess part of the conspiracy is that these would be NATO pilots, so now we've got NATO pilots over Ukraine carrying nuclear weapons. Like, there is a significant amount of, of gap in that logic. Like, a lot of this doesn't make sense, but this is what is being put forward in these nuclear threats. They say, the assessments outlined above form the basis for the decision to conduct Russian military exercises involving part of the forces and means of nuclear deterrence, which are intended to become a sobering signal to the West and its puppet, puppets in Kiev. We hope that this event will cool down the hotheads in Western capitals, will help them understand the possible catastrophic consequences of the strategic risks they generate, and will keep them from both assisting the Kyiv regime in its terrorist actions and from being drawn into the direct armed confrontation with Russia. So I do want to say nuclear tests are not unusual. That happens. Any country is going to regularly throughout the course of a year test their military capabilities. Nuclear capabilities is a portion of that. On the bright side, if we're trying to pull out a positive here, at least Russia is saying something about this. There have been times in history where a nuclear war has almost started because tests have been conducted without clear lines of communication to let one side or the other know, hey, this is a test. We're all watching each other's nuclear capabilities with under, under such a fine microscope that when things are a little bit out of the ordinary, it, it could trigger a response. And when that communication isn't there, sometimes throughout history, that has led us down the path that could have resulted in nuclear war. So a positive here. They're talking. They're communicating that this is going to be a test. Now, in talking about the F-16s, this really has kind of peaked in Russian interest recently. I've seen a lot more communication on Russian telegram channels discussing the impact, or what they're saying, lack of impact, these F-16s will have in the battlefield. Those were uh, originally slated to arrive sometime in 2025. So we're still quite a ways out from that. It sounds like some countries are trying to push that forward to get a couple of these platforms into Ukraine by the end of 2024. And the way some of these more notable platforms like HIMARS, like Storm Shadows, ATACMS, and now the F-16, the way that those have arrived in country has generally been they've gotten there, they've seen action, and then it's announced that they're in theater. Right, So a little bit of, of surprise for the Russian forces. So if we're starting to hear that the F-16s might arrive in Ukraine by, by the end of 2024, 
I would really keep my eyes on that October, November timeframe to where we might start to see F-16s arrive in the air over Ukraine. Just speculation there, but if they are trying to move it forward and they're publicly saying end of the year, probably look a solid 30 to 45 days prior to that before these are actually operational. A quick side note on the F-16 valuable, not valuable debate, not to get too far distracted here. There is value in F-16s arriving in Ukraine, right? If for no other reason, then that is going to be another asset that can help shoot down a variety of missiles and these slow-moving Shahed or from Russia, Garand-style drones. That alone is going to provide a benefit to Ukraine. Uh, of course, they are likely going to be able to force the Russian Air Force and Russian Air Forces to move back a little ways from the front and contest some of that airspace. The F-16 is not a miracle platform. It's not a wonder weapon. It, it has some advantages over some Russian aircraft. In other ways, Russia is going to maintain the advantage. But to say that it, you know, it is going to have an impact, it will be a, a good contribution to the Ukrainian war effort. Now, continuing on with these nuclear tests, the Russian Defense Ministry said that during this exercise, a set of measures will be carried out to practice the issues of preparation and the use of non-strategic nuclear weapons. So tactical nuclear weapons, smaller battlefield nuclear weapons, if you will. This is, we're kind of parsing words at this point, and nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons. Even a tactical one causes a massive amount of destruction. Generally, the way that conversation goes is that tactical nuclear weapons refers to the smaller weapons that would be used on the battlefield against exclusively military targets, right? So it might be small enough to, to conduct a strike against a portion of the Ukrainian lines or against a naval base or an airfield, something like that. Whereas the larger nuclear weapons that we all or all nuclear nuclear armed countries possess could be used to eliminate an entire city or, or large town, things like that. So that's kind of the conversation between tactical and strategic. At the end of the day, it's a massive nuclear weapon, and that's what the tactical side appears what Russia is, is talking about testing here. They say missile forces in the southern military district, which borders Ukraine, aviation units, and the Navy will take part. They said the exercise is aimed at ensuring Russia's territorial integrity and sovereignty in response to provocative statements and threats by certain Western officials against the Russian Federation. So again, they're tying this back to a couple things, statements from Macron and uh, David Cameron talking about, from Macron, putting troops on the ground in Ukraine, in Ukraine, right? Not French troops invading Russia, but putting troops on the ground in Ukraine to defend against Russia. And then David Cameron talking about the ability, uh, kind of permitting Ukraine to use some of the British weapons to strike targets inside of Russia. Russia is, is kind of wrapping all of that up as protecting their own territorial integrity. And I just, who does this, right? It's so This is so frustrating because in any war, no matter what, there has to be some sort of dialogue between the two sides, for, for the most part. I mean, we've had conflicts where that hasn't happened. And it ends up being, being significantly worse, and there's more casualties. You have to be able to have some sort of rational conversation. Russia is going to continue on in this world after this war, right? They're going to be a part of the global economy and, and the, the, the international order that we have today. We have to be able to converse with them. And the, the, the challenge here is that every time they pull out this nuclear card and kind of threaten, hey, we could do this, it just it, it, it turns the conversation away from anything rational. So as an example here, I know it's kind of hard at times to think about this when you're looking at two nations having this conversation or nations and an alliance, but if you boil it down to an individual perspective, I'm going to use a part of a Dan Carlin reference here when he was talking about the Cold War, saying how people were walking around at all times with a loaded gun pointed at their heads. And at some point, they just got used to it and realized they didn't really have any say. If somebody decided, in that case, the Soviet Union decided to pull the trigger and initiate a large-scale nuclear war, it would just be over. There's nothing you could do. Most people were going to die. That's how this is playing out right now. It's, it's, having, it's trying to have a conversation with your neighbor. Imagine walking outside, trying to have a conversation with your neighbor, and every time you start talking, he pulls a gun and puts it to your head. Now, fortunately, he hasn't pulled the trigger yet because you're still able to have that conversation, but you don't know what it's going to take for him to do that. right? You don't know because it hasn't happened in the past. So it's not entirely clear what is going to be that trigger point for him to kill you, right? The, the end state there is catastrophic. You can't afford to mix that up, so you have to take it seriously. The minute he pulls that gun out, the minute that Putin and Russia starts making nuclear threats, you have to take it seriously because of how bad it could go if that actually happens. I understand some folks will want to, it's, it's easy, it's tempting to want to point to the only other time in history that nuclear weapons had been used, the end of World War II, when the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That, is not, that does not help this conversation. 
It doesn't help us to understand what Putin's red lines might be when it comes to nuclear weapons. The reason for that is just entirely different circumstances, right? The United States, when we dropped those bombs, for one, it wasn't entirely clear what they were going to do, not just in the short term, like in the blast radius, but long term, right? So the effects and the impacts of the bomb was not entirely known. And another major one, what was anybody going to do about it? Right? There was no concern that, hey, if we drop these atomic bombs, what if somebody else decides to do that to us? It wasn't in the cards. We were the only ones with a weapon of that magnitude. Of course, that's now a conversation. So we don't know what it would take for Putin to cross that line, recognizing that doing something in the nuclear arena would likely lead to a significant retaliation. So that's it. We're walking around with, with in, in these conversations, the ongoing dialogue with Russia, and every so often they just pull that gun out and point it at your head, and we don't know. It's incredibly frustrating. It's, it's, uh, it's escalatory. I think anytime you bring the nuclear conversation in and start talking about how you could use these weapons, the next step could be that. It's escalatory and brings us further from any sort of positive outcome to what already is a tragic war in Europe. All right, and then jumping into this map comparison exercise, which I feel like it could be feeding the trolls. Not entirely sure. Still, I feel like it's rolling the dice because this is an important conversation. So I have mostly used in my videos Deep State Map, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First, I found it to be uh, pretty reliable, reliable enough for what we are trying to show at this level, right? We're not making tactical decisions on the battlefield by looking at some of these mapping services. It's just a high-level overview of how things are playing out. I haven't seen any major discrepancies with Deep, deep State Map since I've started using them. So for me, that it, it checks that box of reliability. Second, it's a pretty clean map, and it's easy to use. So if you see the map in the video, I feel confident that you could look that up and use that map in the same way that I am. And that's not the case with all mapping services. Some are like really slow, laggy, and, and others are very complicated to try to understand what it is you're looking at. So anyways, I've been using Deep State Map. I saw in a previous video when I used that, uh, a lot of comments saying they are unreliable. They're, they've been purchased by the Ukrainian MOD or partnered with the Ukrainian government, something along those lines. Uh, we'll get into that more here in a second. And a lot of folks saying that the only map you should be using or the only reliable map out there is something called Suryak Maps. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull up a side-by-side -side with Deep State and Suryak and kind of show the differences between those two. Now, there's three things I want to key in on when kind of running through this exercise, if you will. First off, the allegation, I think is the right way to say it, that Deep State map is uh, like a part of the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. I can't find that anywhere at all. Uh, maybe my investigative uh, skills are lacking. The only thing I could find close to that was on the Deep State Map website, they say they have a partner, and that partner is listed as the State Emergency Services of Ukraine. Those are firefighters, EMTs, police, things like that. So it's not the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. It's also not clear what it means when it says partner. Is there data sharing going back and forth? Is there, uh, is there some sort of review process? Is it funding? I have no idea, right? So you can understand how there could be value for a mapping service to have a connection with an emergency service in a country that's at war to understand where are these strikes taking place, where did missiles impact, that's something that the state emergency services would provide. That's the closest I can find to any sort of direct connection between that mapping service and the, the Ukrainian government. Maybe there's something else out there, I wasn't able to come across it. The second big thing here, and this is a, a personal preference, maybe personal bias, I don't think little differences in these maps really matter all that much to us, right? If you're on the battlefield trying to make tactical decisions, of course, they're very important. We're not doing that. We're trying to get an understanding of how the war is playing out. So if a particular tree line is entirely in Russian control or half, or if Ukraine has advanced 300 meters versus 600 meters, that doesn't really change the overall dynamic of the war, right? I understand at times it can be tempting to try to follow that play by play, but we're already getting it late. There's some degree of delay. It is not real-time information. Uh, and really the only time those lines move any significant amount is during a major offensive. And when that happens, the fog of war is even thicker and it becomes much, much longer before we have any clear idea as to what the front lines actually look like. So it's just, I'm not, again, 
the maps are good for big picture. I think it. I think we 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 understood quite a while ago in this war that the day by day movement of the front lines is not really going to be the determining factor of who wins this conflict, right? Maybe at the very beginning. And during portions of major offensives, that becomes very, very important. But day in and day out, it's just not the, the, the major concern as to how this war is moving forward. And then the third part here is this debate between these different maps. Like, there's really not that much difference between any of them. So honestly, like, take your pick, whichever one's easiest for you to use. Here, we'll go ahead and run through the side by side. All right, so we got the two maps pulled up here. I've got Deep State on the left, uh, Suryak on the right, and I'm down here in the middle. What's going on? And there's two areas I want to focus in on, uh, west of Evdivka and then west of Bakhmut. These are two areas that have seen the most dynamic changes in the line over the last couple of weeks. Most of the areas are relatively stagnant. It does do a lot of good, in my opinion, to try to compare those. Uh, but these two, we have seen some movement. So the first thought comparing these two is Deep State uses more curved lines, whereas the Suryak map tends to have more right angles. That makes it look different right out the gate. But if I'm not sure how much there actually is. So we'll zoom in here on both sides right towards kind of the peak advance of the area. Let's see. I see a little bit of difference here on the deep state map. It looks like, yeah, maybe this road is showing as under Russian control by Suryak, but not by deep state. And then it looked like a little difference down here to the south. We'll zoom in a little bit there. Yeah, it looks like on Suryak, they've got the Russian line extending out another 800 meters to the west through these two fields. So there's a difference. It looks like this field... Suryak has under Russian control over here. It's contested. So it's open fields is the difference there. Other than that, not a lot when looking at Oshiterne here, west of Avdivka. Uh, the second one I want to dial into is west of Bakhmut, um, this Chasivyar area. Now, in fairness, most of the movement here has stopped in recent days because Russia has really focused more on airstrikes and trying to kind of hammer the Ukrainian positions. How did I get confused there? Here we go. So Chasivyar pulled up on both maps. Again, Deep State on the left, Suryak on the right. The first thing that jumps out is down here at the bottom. It looks like Suryak has this whole tree line under Russian control, whereas on this side, it's contested still. They have 400 meters being contested versus in Russian control over here. But then they also have some of this field in Russian territory as under Russian control, whereas Suryak has that still under Ukrainian control. Oh, and then a little bit here too. The Suryak map shows that this little pocket, this part of the tree line is under Russian control. Whereas here, that, that 600 meters of a field and tree line Deep State is showing uh, is still being contested. So zoom back out a little bit to get an idea of how this looks a little higher level. I think that's pretty close to the same size. Just not, just not all that different, right? From one to the next, there are differences, and there's going to be differences, but, but by and large, unless you're making tactical decisions on the ground, I, I, I stand by the fact that I think either one of these maps would, would do the trick. And then a final note on this map piece, you know, we're talking about a couple hundred meters at a time difference in a real time environment as this fight is playing out. Overall, you're talking about a 700 kilometer front just inside of Ukraine, right? So I think for a long time now, we've known that these small advances, while they, they, they can add up, right? They can be small and turn large over time, but two to five to 700 meters at a time is not the major difference on the battlefield when the front is 700 kilometers just inside of Ukraine. If you expand that out to include Ukraine and their territory with Russia, where troops have flown across, have, have moved across before, and there still is ongoing fighting there, that's a 1,300 kilometer front. And if you include Belarus, which again, played a major role in the early days of the war, that's a 1,900 kilometer front. 
right? So in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't take much to zoom out a little bit and say, maybe those two to 300 meters here or there are not the most important thing to really get dialed in on. So again, I personal opinion, I think just about any mapping service out there is fine. So long as you're just trying to get an understanding of how the war is generally playing out. All right, then the last item here, we've got a U.S. Army soldier currently being detained inside of Russia. So there's a lot of rumors floating around about this one right now, and I think we're still waiting for all the details to become clear. So I'm going to run through what we know right now as reported by Military.com. They say the Staff Sergeant Gordon Black was on leave and supposed to be en route to the United States. Instead, he flew to China and then eventually to southeastern Russia to meet with a woman, Alexandra Vashchuk where Russian authorities claim that he stole some of her money. They say he stole as much as $2,200 or 200,000 rubles and is currently being held in pre-trial confinement. Now, fortunately, Russia came out and said this case has no relation to politics or espionage, which is a good thing for Sergeant Black because we've seen that in, in multiple other cases where Russia detains an American or a foreign citizen and says they're spying for their government. You can see how easily they would do that when it's somebody who's a, an active duty service member and then it's very, very challenging to get them back, right? We have people in Russian custody right now that are being held as spies for that very reason, because Russia said they were spies. So fortunately for Sergeant Black, he's not being held as a spy, at least not yet. So what this looks like is there were a handful of videos and pictures being posted uh, from both Black and Vashchuk together in South Korea. There's a little back and forth on whether or not Black is still married. He was married. It sounds like this was a girlfriend. They'd started a relationship. Um, and there's some videos where Black was being recorded and kind of interviewed by this Russian woman where he's, he's, he talks about NATO being pretty aggressive and how he understands Russia's intent in Ukraine and why they have to do what they have to do and kind of speaks out on behalf of, of in favor of President Trump and against President Biden. It, it seems like in some of those videos, he's kind of being egged along to, to rattle off some of these points that it, it looks like the girlfriend Vaschuk here likes. And of course, these got a lot of attention, a lot of positive attention inside of Russia. So a little additional information here. There has been a travel advisory in place for U.S. citizens to travel to Russia for quite a while now. That doesn't really impact whether or not somebody does travel to Russia, right? So it's not as though we have people uh, stopping Americans from doing that. Americans are free to go to Russia if they want from our perspective. It's it's that we would just say the State Department says don't do not do that. It's probably not a good thing right now. And one of the reasons is, you know, we're pointing here to Staff Sergeant Black, who just got detained, and there's no clear picture as to how this is going to play out for him. The second part here is I can understand the thought that the Army would know about this or why didn't the Army stop it or how did they allow it. He just would have done this on his own. So if the Army was involved with uh, with paying for providing any of his travel. It wouldn't have necessarily been on military platforms. It likely would have been on commercial airlines flying back from South Korea to the United States. The way to do that is he just doesn't show up to that flight and purchases his own flight. There's nothing stopping him as an American citizen purchasing a flight from South Korea to China. Like it, it, He can just do that, and he did. Uh, and then there's nothing stopping him once he's in China from purchasing a ticket to go into Russia. There's just, there's nobody's going to stop that along the way and say, wait a minute, no travel agent, right? No gate agent, no airline is going to say, hold on, aren't you an active duty member of the U.S. military? You can't do this. So he would have been doing all of this on his, uh, on his own, on his own private accord. And the arm, which you can see this through some of the army statements where they say, hey, he was supposed to be traveling to the United States. And we just got word that he's arrested in Russia. So you know, sounds like a stupid mistake. Uh, bad move. Should have known a lot better than uh, a couple things in here. Certainly traveling to Russia right now to, to visit his girlfriend while a member of the U.S. military or an active duty soldier. Uh, but at the end of the day, he is an American. He's one of us. Hopefully he's treated well. Hopefully he comes home before too awful long. But again, wait for more information to come out on this because the details are a little light right now. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if you're interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack, which is linked in the description below. Substack's like a mix between a newsletter and a website and a podcast now, too. So we're adding all sorts of new media there. We've got audio articles for paid members, discussion boards for members, free articles coming out three times a week, talking about a variety of subjects from South America, Asia, Africa, Middle East, Russia, Ukraine, and quite a bit more. Of course, if interested, all linked in the description below. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.